I want to welcome you to my today's broadcast. I hope you've been following and you've been enjoying the, what we'll be bringing away. And today I'll be looking at the topic that has been of great concern to me, which is uh, uh, I've, it's quite common in the, in the body of Christ today. We are told to confess the word of God. I am this in Christ. I am that in Christ. I am this in Christ. I am that in Christ. Confess the word. Confess the word. Say it over and over again. And continue saying it until you are healed. Continue saying it until you prosper. Continue saying it until God gave it to you. You just repetition, repetition until it makes no meaning anymore. And as I look into this pattern of our Christianity today, of which is about confession, 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 ongoing confessions, and yet nothing happened. And I began to think, does that mean that the word of God that we confess is of no effect or what's really going on here? So the Holy Spirit began to take me through the scripture. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, chapter 3, verse 6, 2 3, 6, the Bible was, uh, Paul was talking there. He said, let me read it quickly. 3, verse 6. The Bible said, for God, who, has, who also had made us able to minister of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit killeth life. Now, I'm going to differentiate to you between the letter and the word of the Spirit. Now, let's start with the letter. We know in the Old Testament, prior to Moses coming into the scene, there was no law. So every man was living according to how he lived. And as a result of that, there was no redirection to God. So people were worshipping God in all different manners, all different ways. And even including Abraham, until they began to understand who God really is, God of heaven that created the heaven of the earth, when God came to him and made covenant with him. It's by faith. He worshipped God and it's by faith that he came to know God according to the word of God. But there are so many other nations or people who could not have that same understanding of how the things of the spirit is. So they got polluted by the mixture of Satan. That's why we start having witchcraft, we start having science. We have all sorts of things, people that can communicate with the spirit. Because they don't have a direct understanding that there is a God who created. They believe there is a God who exists out there, who exists in the sun and the moon, all over the place. So today people chose what was suitable for them and worship. And we still have that to this day. If you go to places like Asia, especially Japan, you discover that they have all sorts of gods, all sorts of idols dedicated to different things around the earth. And that was part of the thing that God got angry that he has to choose a nation for himself, the covenant, of course, of Abraham, we know of, of the Jewish people that became the children of God. Now, if you look at when Moses came, then God gave a law unto Moses. And that letter, that law was written in the tablets. It was written in the law book, which is the tablet, it was carved out, of course, it was recorded in papyrus, in so many other process of printing along the way, like we have the Bible today, but they were recorded, they were scribed, we have to take down these laws and put it in writing from generation to generation. And what they would do with this law is it would be read out to the children of Israel. Some are done yearly when they gather as a congregation, some are done weekly, some are done monthly, some are done daily. From the family altar to the national altar, where all some of these laws, and there were those basic laws that you, you must observe in the house. Then there are the basic laws you will observe as a community. Then there is a law that you must observe as a nation, whereby the whole nation of Israel will come together, they will read this law out of the letter written in tablet or in stone or whatever it was written on. And in that law, you have all sorts of things, all sorts of penance, uh, how to ask for forgiveness, how to do this, when this person broke that law, when that family do this, do that, it will all there. So it will be read out and everything will be carried out according to the law. That's a letter. Now, it became so much so that people, the Pharisees, or the, 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 the ministers, 
or the priests who interpret this law, they began to interpret it in their own way because this is how it is written and this is how it is. If Moses said, you must, you don't like your wife anymore, you want to send her away, Moses said you must write a letter of divorce and give it to her and she must go. There was no contest to that. If a child offends his parents or defy the parents or something like that, he must be stoned to death. That's what the law says. It's written there. So when you come to the judge, the judge is going to refer to it. What was written in the law of Moses? Okay, this is what was written. We must follow it, follow it, follow it. And it will be executed accordingly. So in the process, a lot of these laws were misinterpreted and became an obstacle to the things of God. Remember, when the law was given, it was not to pull man away from God. It was actually to draw man close to the Lord, to his maker. That was the primary reason of the law being given. In other words, if you look at the law, it was always about God and about man. God created man in his own, in his own image. Man is the closest to God in, in, amongst all his creation. So God gave this law to guide man unto him, to walk with him as the master. So men began to take this law for their own services and began to use it for their own gain, for their own end. So the priest, in the process, we saw corruption came in, we saw misinterpretation, we saw all kind of doctrines came and literally polluted the whole system. So there was no longer fairness, which the law was about fairness towards men. There was no longer justice, which was justice between men. And there was no longer righteousness. Because when there is no justice, there is no righteous. If there's no justice, if there's no justice, there's not going to be righteousness towards God. Because justice is righteousness towards God. If you if, if if you live a just life, you are righteous before the Lord. So you are pleasing the Lord. So if your life is not justifying unto the Lord, in other words, you are not living righteously. So because of this doctrine of men, interpretation of the law as they wish or as it suits them. It became circumvented towards the benefit of man. So man circumvented the law to benefit him, no longer God. So a little bit of God here, a little bit of God there, but in there it was actually for the purpose of man. Because the priest began to take bribe. We see the priest began to pervert justice, all sorts of things that are happening. So the letter could not give life. It couldn't give life. So what we now saw, we saw a situation whereby People were more in bondage with the law of Moses rather than being free. Or being free to be close to God. It actually made them alienated to God because now suddenly you now find yourself, you are caught up. In this thing, you get in, you cannot get out. Because you're always in, you cannot get out. You are always guilty, it's always pointing to you what you've done right, what you've done wrong. And the priests are there to interpret this law as they wish. No longer as the Lord commanded them in the time of Israel, the time of Moses. So Paul is saying that the law, when you read the letter, what the letter does, the letter does not give life. The letter does not profit nothing. But the letter will eventually kill. Why? Because the letter has no power as when you apply it with the Spirit. What makes the letter powerful, what makes the law powerful, was if it's accompanied with the Spirit. The difference, between, the difference between the prophet and the priest in the Old Testament was that the prophets, they were accompanied by the Spirit of God. So when they speak, they speak with the Spirit of God in them. But in the context of within the law, they were not speaking outside the law. They speak within the law, you know, within the letter, but with the power of the Holy Spirit behind what they speak. So it became powerful more than what the, the, the priest was administering in the temple. So when, they speak, when, when the prophets speak, the people listen. But when the priest does his thing, there's perversion because 
The spirit of the Lord was not upon them. Everything was mechanical. Everything was interpreted according to Moses. According to Moses, but forgetting that God gave Moses that letter to interpret to the people. Forgetting that God is that word is written is given by God Himself that's supposed to work, guide, and lead. But people took it and make it subverted for themselves as it suits them. So it brought death unto men. So Paul was saying that the letter, as much as good as it may be, but it kills. It does not give life. But accompanied by the Spirit, you will have power in it. That's the reason why you see that when you listen to the Word of God, what transformed you is not what you hear every Sunday. Because you hear so much so that if we listen and if we do what we hear, one-tenth of what we hear, our life will be transformed. We hear, we hear, that we hear, and nothing happens. Why? Because we don't allow the Spirit to interpret it into our spirit. When the Spirit interprets it to our spirit, it becomes a rhema, then it becomes alive. The Word of God is supposed to be subject to our daily living. In other words, what you read should become alive inside of you. If it's not alive inside of you, you just read, you read, you study the Bible very diligently, you meditate upon it very diligently, but yet you are not allowing the Spirit to interpret it into your spirit, it becomes just a letter. And that's the reason why, you see, we see Christians today, they will confess and confess and confess and confess and nothing happens. Simply because their encounters, their experience is based on the letter of the word. The Bible says, I am the Son of God, I am redeemed from the cause of the Lord, so I am no longer under a cross. The Bible says, I am here I am not sick because the stripe of Jesus. Yes, this is the end of scripture. But the question is, when you don't appropriate it with the spirit man or with the spirit of God inside of you that transform that word into Rema, it's just going to be another talk, another waste of words. It's not going to produce what it's meant to produce. I know people say, no, you need faith. You need to have faith. You need to have faith. I don't believe for one that you, when you are a Christian, you come to Christ, the day you genuinely confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, that you don't have faith. For you to have even come to confess Him as your Lord and Savior, I believe that's great faith right there. And for faith to not acquire, to receive from the Lord, is another matter. But you have to understand that the Bible said our levels of faith are all different. Some are bigger than others, some are smaller, but yet this, they, they, that faith is still there. So sometimes it's not about faith, but it's about having the knowledge of the Word of God, how it manifests in our lives. So we cannot be quoting scripture day after day, night after night, nothing happens. Does that mean that the Word of God does not have power behind it? Or why is that we say, we pray, nothing happens, we shout, it doesn't happen, we confess, it doesn't happen, or everything we do, it just doesn't happen. Why? The Bible says here that it is the Spirit that gives life. The Spirit does not give, the Spirit of God does not, if you don't allow the Spirit of God to give life to what you're saying, nothing is going to happen. You can confess until Jesus come, you will be where you are. But it takes understanding the Word of God as a life before it can work in us. I'll give you an example. We all go to school, we, when we go to school, we study all sorts of subjects we are meant to study. It depends on what you're reading for. Now, when we study that subject in the classroom, not only do we just study it to, there are some we study just to pass the exam, but there are some we have to really put into it because that is going to play out in our place of work in the near future. If, for instance, we just to, just to study, to pass the exam, what do we do? We read and read and read. We cram everything in our heads. We go into the exam hall. We write it. We pass the exam. As soon as we finish writing the exam, we pass. We forget about what we read. Why? Because we just read to pass that exam. But if we read the same chapter because we want it to use we want that chapter to actually transform our lives 
Not only do we read it to have an understanding, we also read and put in some very practical aspects to it until it becomes alive in us. So there are things I regret, for instance, when I was in school in those days. Some, th some teachings that were, we were taught in class, because we didn't have access to the practical side of things, these things were just in theory. So when I graduated, some of these things I don't know. I haven't even seen them. I don't know what they look like. So they didn't make no meaning to me. But I remember in later, li in later in life, when I began to see this thing practically, physically, what they look like, it made a lot of changes in my life. And I, so now I used to say, if these things, if I knew what I knew now, I would have gone to the moon and be back by now. The knowledge and I have now, if I was taught then, you see, all they were just teaching us was basically just graduate and move on to the next chapter of your life. But that did not help compared to if we were being taught to be finished, everything we're taught in classroom, everything was there for us to see, to work with, to practice with. I tell you, we, go, we, we, we graduate, we'll be a better person, that we might not even need to look for a job. Some of us we might have to just create a job for ourselves. So the school system teaches you about the letter, theory, things that you have not seen, you, you've not heard of. They teach you, you, you have a vague idea. Because you have not really seen it, it does not stick into your mind. It doesn't stick into you. The same thing, when you read the Word of God, if the Holy Spirit is not the one that interprets it to you, you can confess from here until Jesus comes, it's not going to make any changes in your life. Now, Understanding the Word of God or letting the Word of God to be effective in our life has to include the application with the Holy Spirit because He is the one that has to actually applicate it in our life, teaches us to let it stick in our Rema brain of thinking. Outside of that, you will keep confessing and confessing with no results. Now, you look at it this, I look at it this way. When the word of God is spoken. The Bible said it will not come back to the Lord void. How come we don't get results? We make it void. Simply because we have not paid attention to what we have just said. So when we take it out, it comes back to us empty because we spoke, we, we, we spoke it in an emptiness. So we might say deep our mind, there might be expectancy, we might want to, but the truth is, because we are not allowing the Holy Spirit to empower what we have said, nothing comes out of it. The Word of God is not because it's no longer what it is, or it's not powerful, or it's of none effect. No, it's simply because we have not learned to allow the Holy Spirit to apply unto the Word that we speak. When you look at your work with the Lord over the years, certain things you have said, certain things you have believed, you have confessed, you have even paid tithes and offering towards it, and yet nothing happened. Does that mean that God is unfaithful in His ways? No. What I've come to understand, my ways of trying to live the Word of God is this way. Living by, in a more practical sense, when they read the Word of God, they say, this is what you should do. It's an instruction. It gives you instructions. You must do this. You must do this. You must do that. You must do that. You said, okay. If you follow what you read, what, what I mean, I'm not saying confess. You do what you do, what the Lord asks you to do in His Word. The Bible said you will profit. It will be meaningful. It will produce results. But if what you read, you don't put it into practice, for instance, I've got children, and when these children come to me, what do they do? They want to. I have kids. My children, they don't need to confess me as their father. Because they already know who their father is. They don't have to confess the promises I already made to them regarding who they are in me or what they will inherit in me. It's automatic. If my children start to do that, 
wake up in the morning affirming me as their father through their confession in me, they will need to go to the mental hospital. That means they are not right, they are not okay in their brain. Because automatically they know who their father is. So they don't need to affirm themselves or affirm their, 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 they don't need to affirm themselves to me daily as their father because they already know whom their father is. They don't need to confess what I've already worked for, which is directly their inheritance, anyway, anyhow, because that give and take, whatever the dad has promised us or what he's going to do for us, or everything he has laid out for us is ours, now or later in life. So, for them now to say, as, a, as my children, they want to affirm me to get that assurance, they cannot do that. Because, like I said, they know who their father is. The same thing I work with God supposed to be. If we know that God or Christ is our father, we believe in his word, all that he has said about us, what we are supposed to do is to glorify him or is to walk into that newness daily. Walking into that newness is not by affirming our confession, I know I'm here in Christ, I know I will not be poor in Christ, I know the Bible says I will not be... No! These are things he already said about you. It, but the condition puts in there is that if you walk in obedience, these things will be given unto you. Quite often times, we know we don't walk in obedience according to his word. We allow disobedience to ride our life. So in the process of letting disobedience ride in our life, we walk in that disobedience whereby denying ourselves those inheritance that automatically belongs to us. So we pray, nothing happened. We confess, nothing happened. We cry unto the Lord, nothing happened. Why? Oftentimes, we don't want to connect it to our obedience. Rather, we want to religiously connect it. Oh, you say your word, so you will do that. You say if I give, you see if I preach, you see if I do that. So it's like you are holding God to his word in the negative from knowing that you are the one who is guilty of something or you are the one that needs to get your way right with them or you are not working in disobedience but you want to make him feel as if he's the one that is not listening to you. Of which the word of God said, if you love me, Jesus said, if you love me, you keep my commandment. You follow me. You do what I ask you to do. Then all these things shall be yours. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness then everything is what? Follow you. Everything is. There was no limitation, including healing, prosperity, you name them. But what we want to do, we, we want to seek our agenda, our agendas, we present our plans to him, then we, we, we ask him, you must endorse it. If you don't endorse it, we're going to come in another fashion and present another agenda. We want to bend his hand, we want to twist his hand to, to, to endorse our agenda, not his agenda. Not his, not his will be done in our life, but our will be done. Then there's a, that, that creates a conflict between our relationship with him. So we confess the word of God, it becomes of non effect. We pray day and night, nothing happens because we are not living according to the principle of the word. The Word of God can only become effective in our life or can become alive in our lives if we walk in accordance with His commandment. And in that, the Holy Spirit will bring it to pass whatever we ask or whatever we say. But as long as we are walking outside the will of God, we can confess whatever we need to confess. Use the Word of God and all that. Nothing is going to happen. It will just be words, just be oratory, just be, we quote, I am this, I am that, and yet nothing happened. And we, we eventually make the word of God of literally of non-effect. As the Bible puts it, in Mark chapter 7 verse 13, the Bible said we literally we made the word of God of non-effect. It's not because the word of God is not effective. 
But because we are not alive, we have not allowed or we have not applied or we've not allowed the Holy Spirit to apply to what we say. So we confess, we pray, we seek his face, and yet nothing happens. And it looks like the word of God is dead. Absolutely not true. The word of God is alive. Except you allow the Holy Spirit to make it alive in you, it will be dead in your life. It can never be alive by human knowledge or intellectuals. We are good in quoting the scriptures from Genesis to Revelations. But yet, it has no meaning in our life. In conclusion, we quote the whole scripture into our mind, in our brain, in our confession, day and night. But we don't align it with the Holy Spirit. And the scripture says that when, John, when Jesus was living, he told his disciples, when I send the Holy Spirit to you, he's going to teach you all things. He's going to show you all things. He's going to remind you all things. So, the word of God, either it can build you onto life, or it can destroy you. It depends on how you applicate it. If you applicate it in the manner of your understanding, you will confess and confess nothing will happen. The son does not need a confession to remind him who his father is. We know who our father is. We know his promises in the world of, that he has, he has given unto us. But how we apply it unto us, how we believe in it, how we allow that word to become part of our lives, is what makes the changes. That's the secrecy of the word of God. If it's just by confessing it, and it's done accordingly, by now, every Christian wouldn't have been found wanting. But because we have not learned how to allow the Holy Spirit to cement, to complete the works of Calvary through the Word of God in our lives, we just keep confessing. I know some of you preachers will listen to say, no, the Bible says we must... Confessed, no, my friend, when you have an alliance, you have a relationship with someone, you don't need to be told that person is part of you. If you are indeed you are a part of Christ, you live according to his command. And the Bible says it, can, it shall be unto you according to your word, what you speak through his word. But as long as you want to do it your own way, I want to do it in my own way, my own understanding. Leave out the Holy Spirit to guide you through the letter that is written beforehand. You are still going to continue to live in desperation, in hopelessness, and thinking God has forsaken you when he has not. And the enemy, Satan, is going to continue to point guilt at your face, telling you it's because you've done this, because you've done that, because you've done this, because you've done that. Simply because you have not learned to apply the word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. Come to think of it, without the Holy Spirit, where is the word? Because he was there in creation. If you remember in Genesis chapter 1, the Bible says he was hovering above the waters, just waiting for the command of the Lord. And as the Lord began to command, let there be, he began to establish it. So oftentimes, as Christians, we don't know who we're dealing with. That's the way our problem is. We don't know the power or the presence or the role of the Holy Spirit in our Christian world. So we'll confuse everything to one thing. The letter of the word. The Bible said, the Bible said, but it's good to know the word. It's good to understand how to pray. But if you don't know how the word of God works in you, you're not going to find fulfillment in your Christianity. I hope you are blessed. Even if you are not blessed, at least let the word of God that transform our lives transform something in you. Don't forget to share. That's what you owe the Lord. You need to share the word of God. So help me share this video so that others can benefit from it. God bless you. Till next time, you take care of yourself. Bye-bye.